Hi and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video we're going to go through an introduction to our legal system in Canada This video would be useful for pretty much anybody getting ready for any financial services exam. Uh, we'll also be building some continuing education courses as I include this video. And if you're looking to understand insurance law or securities law or family law or estate law, all of which are important elements of the financial services industry, this video would be a useful starting point. So we're going to break this down into five elements that we'll discuss. We're going to briefly discuss the common law and what it means. We're going to look at statute law and understand what statute law consists of and where it comes from. We're going to look at the role of the courts. We're going to look at the role of our elected government in this process. And we're going to look at the role of self-regulatory organizations or SROs. These self-regulatory organizations fill a fairly important role in the financial services sector in Canada. So the common law to start. The common law dates back to roughly the 1150s and what we saw here was an attempt to create one common set of laws where previously there had been none and the basic idea here was to bring together the laws that were being used in different parts of the land into one common system. So under a common law system, we're going to put heavy stock in what's called precedent law, or sometimes we refer to this as case law. And that stands in opposition, roughly, to other systems of law, including uh, case law, or sometimes we call this, sorry, code law. Sorry, it stands in opposition to code law, or sometimes we refer to this as Napoleonic law. or sometimes civil law. And of course in Canada we do have this practiced in Quebec. And this is pretty common in other parts of the world too that have their origins back to the French colonial tradition. And we have other alternatives too such as the law of equity or laws of equity. And we still do have some laws of equity practiced in Canada. We sometimes find this when we have civil damages awards, for example, the law of equity is really an attempt to put both parties in a position that's fair relative to their problem or to their concern. Unlike then these other two sets of laws, the main concern around precedent law or case law is predictability. And this focus on predictability is designed to allow commerce to occur. So the idea here is that in a case law system, we have a fairly easy time conducting business because we know if we go to court what the outcome will be based on what's happened previously. Now, statute law, this is where we are starting from for the purpose of most legal discussions. This is our written set of laws. So we're going to have written laws here, such as the Income Tax Act or our Criminal Code. So this is our written set of laws. And these written laws then provide the basis for um, most discussions around how the law is going to work. And what generally happens then is when we have a gap here, that's when we have to refer back to the common law. So the common law gives us a body of case law that we can draw on to make a determination about how a particular matter might be handled when our statute law 
doesn't adequately address that. And then we can look at the role of the courts. So the courts in Canada are part of the various departments of justice, either at the federal level or at the provincial level, and their role is the enforcement of our laws as written. So what happens then is if we have a, a matter at the provincial level, and we do have to understand that there are differences here, section 91 of the Constitution Act of 1867 tells us what falls under federal authority, and section 92 tells us what falls under provincial authority. It is important to understand the differences here. Uh, for example, most securities and insurance matters fall under issues of provincial authority. Most income tax questions fall under federal authority, although there are provincial authorities for the collection and administration of our income tax legislation. So what we're going to have then is the courts are going to deal with this at a number of different levels depending on the type of question. If we have a tort that is an issue where one party feels that they've had harm done to them by another party in a financial or physical or reputation sense, then the courts may get involved. So a tort is sort of our fancy name for a lawsuit. And what happens here is one party sues another and most of these matters would start off at the provincial superior or supreme court or the court of queen's bench whatever word we happen to use for it and it's sort of a misnomer when we talk about a superior or supreme court here this is the first level of court you would deal with in most lawsuits from there if the parties are not satisfied, they may end up at a provincial court of appeal. And these are really the two provincial courts with which we're primarily concerned. And from there, we may end up at the Supreme Court of Canada, which is quite rare. It's not very common for cases to end up at the Supreme Court of Canada. They'll typically see somewhere between about 50 to 75, definitely less than 100, cases that arise from provincial superior courts originally in a year and they're generally going to choose cases that are of national interest or cases where there's uh, some key question that the Supreme Court feels is important. They're not just going to choose cases, cases on the basis of an amount of money at stake or something like that. And then we look at elected government so the role of elected government here is to pass new laws. So what will sometimes happen then is we may have a case that goes to, let's say, a provincial court of appeal or all the way to the Supreme Court, and maybe our current government is not happy with that or the current government is somehow compelled to step up and take some role with respect to this. So they will say, okay, we're going to write a law And that law creates some clarity where otherwise we'd have to refer to precedent or whatever the case is. So we're trying to maybe create some clarity or establish policy. And sometimes we have scenarios where the government is happy with the decision made by the Supreme Court. Uh, currently, as of 2014, we have, of course, a fairly high-profile uh, level set of disputes between our Supreme Court and our current federal government. And then we have self-regulatory organizations. So what happens here is that some authority... So somebody, either Department of Justice or otherwise, will devolve some authority. So some level of government says, we don't want to deal with every routine administrative matter, or we don't want to deal with items that are of relatively low concern. So we're going to devolve certain authority to 
a self-regulatory organization, an SRO. And these SROs, these are industry organizations. And these industry organizations are going to then take responsibility for the more sort of routine or regular matters so that government doesn't have to get involved with with these little items with every nitpicky little thing that comes up. So we're just going to pass on responsibility for routine administrative matters. And we have a couple examples of SROs in this country, the MFDA, the Mutual Fund Dealers Association, or IROC as well, are examples of securities SROs. So the MFDA deals with most matters concerning um, just the routine practice of mutual fund dealers. And then in the four western provinces as well, we have the insurance councils. So they do, both MFDA and the insurance councils, create um, regulation that has the force of law, but they are somewhat limited in their authority. They really are limited to be able to deal with those routine administrative matters. So we're going to delve into some of these in more detail as we push forward, but this provides us with a brief overview of the Canadian legal system. I hope this is helpful. Enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to look at part two of our introduction to the Canadian legal system. And specifically, what we're going to look at here is we're going to follow roughly the path of flow that we're going to simplify it a little bit of a court case, how this might actually look. So we're going to have uh, two entities here. We're going to have Fred, and then we're going to have ABC Insurance Co., which we'll just call ABC from here on. And so what we have is Fred and ABC Insurance Co. have entered into an insurance contract. Now we're going to deal with contract law in a later video. But for now, we can see that Fred and ABC Insurance Co. have entered into this insurance contract. This creates a relationship between the two. Now, at some point down the road, let's say that Fred finds himself in a position where he feels that ABC Insurance Co. should pay him something as a result of this insurance contract, and ABC Insurance Co. says, no, we don't feel that way, so we have maybe a denied claim here. And this denied claim, then, brings us to insurance legislation. So almost certainly we would end up dealing under the Provincial Insurance Act for the province in which Fred is resident. That's almost certainly what would happen. There are some possible exceptions to that, but that's almost certainly how this works out. So Fred says, I'm not satisfied with this. He tries some informal means of resolution. A lot of times today, the courts won't entertain Fred's claim unless it looks like he has tried his informal means of resolution, and there are all kinds of these. Most insurers have an ombudsman, and then there would likely be a provincial insurance ombudsman as well. Most provinces have one. So he tries the various ombud services that are available, and he does not get any satisfaction out of that. So now, what he might do is he might pursue a tort. And a tort refers to a harm caused to Fred's wealth, property, person, or dignity. In this case, he would demonstrate most likely that it's harm caused to his wealth. And a tort simply is a fancy way of saying a lawsuit. Tort is from the French, literally, for harm. So this is our lawsuit here. Sorry, I guess those quotes are not appropriate. And 
this still might result in an informal resolution. It's actually quite common in our legal system today, owing especially to the costs associated with going to court, that we would maybe make an out-of-court settlement. So we might settle out of court, but that's not a particularly, or that's not how we want to resolve this here, because we want to see how the whole system works. So what happens now is before we go to court, we're going to go through the process of discovery. There might even be a little bit of negotiation that happens here. And discovery is simply when we have a sharing of evidence. So this is where both parties present evidence. And typically it's done in a somewhat informal setting uh, with a reporter, with a court clerk there to write this all out, but not under the eye of a judge or anything like that. So then we end up, assuming we can't make a successful out-of-court settlement, we end up in court. And we would end up at what's called the court of first instance. And that simply means the first court that you go to under ordinary circumstances. In this case, the court of first instance, depending on the province that you're in, is going to be called the superior court. Or somewhat misleading, the supreme court or maybe a court of Queen's Bench. These are the terms we normally apply here. Other examples of courts of first instance include, uh, for example, family courts or traffic courts or most criminal courts or courts of first instance. So this is just the first place we're going. A state courts or probate courts are also courts of first instance. And once we're done here at the court of first instance, or so what will happen here at the court of first instance is both parties will present their evidence. And of course, we're assuming that there are lawyers involved here. So they're going to present their evidence before a judge, and then that judge makes the determination. A ruling. And this ruling is going to be based on a couple of different items. So the judge is going to look at the laws as written. The judge will refer to statute law. And if there's a very clear set of facts, so this is where we get into a very important legal concept called the questions of fact or a question of fact. So if the facts in Fred and ABC's case match up to something that's described very clearly in statute law, the judge probably has a fairly easy time of this. However, that's not that common. It's quite common that the facts are not as clear as what we see laid out in statute law. And that's where we would refer to common law. And this is where the judge is going to look for a precedent. And once again, we're going to look for a precedent that matches the facts in Tom's particular case. And what will typically happen here is, sorry, in uh, Fred's particular case, I apologize. Fred's lawyer will make an argument that says this precedent, precedent applies. ABC Insurance will make arguments that say this precedent applies. They'll both argue back and forth about which precedent is appropriate. So now we're going to come to a ruling. So the judge makes a ruling based on these factors. Now, we may end up with, and it's quite likely we do in fact, end up with somebody who's dissatisfied here, somebody who feels that this ruling is incorrect. And that's where either Fred or ABC Insurance Co. might file an appeal. And this takes us to the next level in the provincial court system, which is the appeals courts. The appellant courts or appeals courts. And what happens at the appeals courts, it's not going to be a new case here. Basically, we in most provinces have three senior judges. And these three senior judges will review the work done by the judge at the court of first instance. So they'll review the first judge's work and they'll say, hey, did that first judge properly apply 
the questions of fact here. That is, were the facts properly applied? And how did they match up? How did those questions of fact match up with the statute law? Was that properly applied? And how did that apply back to the common law? So these judges are going to review these factors and make a determination and say yes or no, this works or this doesn't work. Now generally that's where we stop. Generally the appeals courts will make a ruling and that's where most cases stop. It's rare, quite rare in fact, but it is possible that we could have a further level of appeal And in this case, if you're going to appeal, you're going to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada says, okay, we only look at a small number of cases each year, somewhere less than 100 cases, that come from the provincial court system are seen by the Supreme Court in a given year. And what happens then at the Supreme Court is they will choose cases based on national, national interests or if there's a constitutional question or sometimes the Supreme Court chooses cases where there's a gap where they interpret there to be a gap in legislation where they say, hey, the, the legislators at a particular level should identify this gap. We're going to point it out for them that there is this gap. We're going to see that case. Now, this is a very expensive process, quite cumbersome, quite time consuming, not the ideal way to settle most matters, but it does happen that some cases end up at the Supreme Court. Now, once we are at the Supreme Court, here these judges will see evidence and they will treat the case as if it's a new case. They'll see everything from scratch in most cases. And based on that, they will make a ruling. And because these rulings almost inevitably create a precedent, and that precedent generally applies in all provinces that have similar legislation. So because of this, the Supreme Court goes through a lot of work when they're writing their decisions. And we'll see this, that the majority decision, that is the ruling decision or the winning decision, there will be a, a raft of uh, legal thought behind it. And that legal thought is all presented so that anybody can go and look it up. And then even the minority judges write a very long decision, typically, stating all of their opinions on the matter and why they feel that the decision should have gone the other way. This becomes very important because of the weight that we give to Supreme Court of Canada decisions. So I hope this helps to understand our legal system. We don't want to end up in court. You can see that it can be quite an onerous and expensive process. but it's good to understand this process, and I think it does help to understand the relationship between statute law and common law, what we really mean when we talk about a precedent. I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very kindly. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to look at legal relationships. We're going to work on defining the relationships that two parties might have or more than two parties might have in some cases in the eyes of the law and see what these relationships mean and how they translate into uh, various degrees of responsibility. So the first, the first level of relationship that we'll consider is what's called a duty of care. And the duty of care is the relationship that we owe to most of the people that we deal with in our lives. So this is people essentially in passing. If you have property, you owe a duty of care to people who are visiting your property, who are invited to your property, who are doing work on your property, and even trespassing on your property, although the extent to which you're 
duty of care is owed varies there, but it's important to note here that we have a duty of care to an invitee, that is somebody that you actively invite. You have a duty of care to somebody who's working on your premises. And you have a duty of care, as I mentioned, to even a trespasser, somebody who's there without your permission. And that's actually very important, helping us to understand a duty of care and why it's important. This is where we take appropriate steps to make sure that our property is in such a condition as not to cause others harm. Now, that duty of care means that I could find myself in trouble if I have caused somebody else harm. So what we're looking at here, we're going to deal with a concept called negligence. So negligence means that I have done something that has caused harm to another party. And there are typically three elements of negligence here. So there would have to have been a duty of care owed. So one party owes another party a duty of care. And that means that, as we say, most of the people we deal with in our day-to-day -day lives, in passing, we owe a duty of care to. I may not owe a duty of care to somebody halfway around the world, at least not by default, but there may be something in my relationship with that person which causes me to owe them a duty of care. And then I would have to have breached that duty of care. And finally, that there actually has to have been harm caused. So we have to remind ourselves then that these three things have to have happened, that I owed that person duty of care, that I breached that duty of care, and that that caused harm to that other party. And if those three things can't be proven, then we probably don't have a concern here. Now that harm, as we've seen in other videos, might be financial harm, it might be physical harm, it might be reputational harm. It could be emotional harm. And I should remind everybody that if you're actually trying to solve a legal problem yourself, you want to go and get yourself competent legal advice. These are only very, very broad generalities that we speak in, and each individual circumstance is quite different, potentially. So a duty of care is the basic level of relationship. We then have the possibility that there's a professional relationship. And the professional relationship is typically defined by some sort of exchange of money, where we're actually paying for this relationship. So we might be paying for advice, for example. That would typically put us into a professional relationship. And here, we expect this person to be competent. This is the expected standard. This is actually where, despite much of what we hear otherwise, as of today, it's uh, mid-2014 here, as of today, this is where most financial services relationships lie, is in the area of professional relationships. So, for example, insurance and investment advisors typically owe their clients a professional relationship or professional duty, which means that, hey, that client's paid for advice and we have to be competent here. So this sets a higher standard than what we see under duty of care. We saw under duty of care that we had to demonstrate that a duty of care was owed and that that duty of care was breached. Here, we've already established that there's a professional, professional relationship, so we have to show that so we've already established that. So we have to simply demonstrate here that the person who provided that professional advice was not competent. That doesn't mean they have to be right. That's not the same as being right. There are times when it's okay to be wrong, and examples of that sometimes are interpretations of more complicated areas of the Income Tax Act. And then we have the highest standard of care that might be owed, and that is a fiduciary standard. Or a fiduciary duty. And in a fiduciary standard, or a fiduciary duty, here 
we have to put the best interests of the other party ahead of our own. So here we have to look at what's in that other party's best interests ahead of our own. This is a very rigid standard. There are actually not that many relationships under Canadian common law that fall into this realm of a fiduciary duty or fiduciary standard. We have the leading case. Oh, I should mention one more thing here. We also have to establish what's called a special relationship of trust, or we have to prove that the special relationship of trust existed. Now I am going to show in a few minutes here where there have been examples of a fiduciary standard with financial advisors, but it's not the default, despite what you'll find taught in several courses, for example. So this fiduciary standard or fiduciary duty, so what happens here is, sorry, where we look at this to define it, there's actually a case in Canada, case is Frame v. Smith. And in the case of uh, Frame v. Smith, what happened here, we had a parent, Smith, who was withholding visitation rights from Frame. So this is a divorced couple or a separated couple. And Frame uh, is not being permitted to see the kids, and Smith is essentially poisoned in that relationship. Frame sues and says, hey, it's in the kid's best interest to get to spend time with me. Smith is preventing that from happening. Smith is not acting in the best interest of the children. And this is actually where we see fiduciary standard defined. So one example of a fiduciary standard in Canada then is parents to their children. Other examples, doctors have a fiduciary relationship with their patients. Lawyers generally have a fiduciary relationship with their uh, clients, accountants, in some cases do, but not by default. Accountants generally have a fiduciary relationship when they're fulfilling an audit capability. Directors of corporations have a fiduciary relationship to the corporation. Trustees of trusts and executors of estates have a fiduciary relationship to the beneficiaries of a trust. The fiduciary relationship in a state is a little bit more complicated. In most cases, it's considered to be a fiduciary relationship with the testator, the deceased person. We have a fiduciary relationship sorry, with actuaries. There's actually a legislated fiduciary relationship when actuaries are doing certain calculations. So those are some common examples of fiduciary relationships. So I promised that I would show a fiduciary relationship at work with a financial advisor. The leading case in Canada is a case called Hodgkinson v. Sims. And what happened in this particular case was Sims is actually an accountant. So I just mentioned that an accountant generally only has a fiduciary relationship when fulfilling this audit responsibility, but generally not when providing advice. So this dates back to British Columbia in the early 1980s. And what happened here was the Hodgkinsons had gone to Sims, the accountant, for advice concerning what they should do as far as tax planning went. And Sims, as part of that advice package, recommended to them that they invest in a, an investment called a MERB, a multi-unit residential building. And this multi-unit residential building, it was actually part of a much bigger problem in BC in the early 80s, but the bottom fell out from this investment and Sim, sorry, Hodgkinson lost a bunch of their money or all of their money. What they subsequently discovered was that Sims was actually making a commission on this sale. And he had not disclosed that to them when they invested in this MERB. Now, of course, if the investment had gone well, we would have never had a problem here. But the investment went poorly. And what ends up happening then is the Hodgkinsons successfully sue Sims. They're able to say, hey, he had a fiduciary responsibility here because we established this special relationship of trust where we came to him for tax advice. And he manipulated that 
relationship by essentially filling a role that we didn't agree on him filling. Now, if he had simply given them bad tax advice, let's say he'd given them the wrong advice about what might constitute a capital loss or something like that, that probably would have just been a question of competence. But they felt it was important to demonstrate that he was acting as a fiduciary and they were successful in this argument. And because he was acting as a fiduciary, so it's harder to prove that this is the case, but once you can prove this is the case, now it's easier to recover damages. Now this person is expected to act with more care, and therefore we say, hey, we're going to really punish you for having violated that fiduciary duty. If it had strictly been a question of a professional relationship, it might have been harder for the Hodgkinsons to recover any loss. Now, these are all our sort of default arrangements, but if I want to go beyond these relationships, if I want to establish a more firm relationship, that's where we delve into areas of contract law. So that's where we want to have a contract, and that establishes a relationship beyond just these default relationships. And we will talk about contract law in a later video and define what a contract actually is. So the contract can establish a better defined relationship. And then we're not worried about proving that, hey, you, were, you owed me a duty of care, or you owed me a professional relationship or a professional duty, or you owed me a fiduciary duty. Instead, we use this contract, and this defines the relationship between these two parties. So if I don't want to fight this battle later on. I'm going to go and I'm going to deal with contract law here. Now, that being said, if we go to a lawyer to have them write a contract for us, that lawyer is acting on their fiduciary standard, but the contract then is established between the parties to the contract. So I hope that helps. I want to remind everybody that if you're looking for legal advice, you go find yourself a competent legal professional who understands the issues at hand. This is meant simply as a general overview of some fairly complicated legal principles. I hope this helps. Thank you very much and enjoy your continued studies. Hi and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this particular video we're going to look at the corporation. Now, there are a number of reasons why we incorporate, but what we're concerned with for the purposes of this course primarily is the business corporation. The idea of incorporation dates back to around 1200 or so when we started to see in England uh, municipalities um, permitted to incorporate, notably the city of London traces its incorporation back to 1215. For business purposes, we didn't see corporations used until the early 1600s with the Dutch East Indies Company out of Holland. Today, though, the corporation is a very ordinary way to operate a business. So here's what we have with a corporation. You'll normally see it drawn like so as a little rectangle, and we'll call this just the corp. And so we have a variety of people that are involved with the corporation, but fundamentally the corporation is its own separate tax and legal entity. So this means it files its own tax returns, it has its own tax year, it has its own tax rates. So for all of these purposes it's a separate entity and it uses even a different tax return form. It uses a T2, whereas a person normally uses a T1 in Canada. The legal aspects, it's actually considered to be what we call a legal person. And what that means is that it can sue and be sued. It can enter into contracts. It is actually considered to be a separate person for legal purposes. So now we have the variety of people who are involved in the corporation, and it's important to understand this. One of the big considerations around incorporating is that we're going to create this separate entity, but we have to have some people who are involved in this. So first off, we're going to have our shareholder or shareholders. 
And these are generally either the people who originally put up the capital to create this corporation or people who have, since the corporation was first incorporated, people who have acquired shares from those people who originally acquired it or from the corporation itself. Now, these shareholders have three rights. They have the right to dividends of the corporation, which is a share of the after-tax profits of the corporation. They have voting rights, which is probably the most important right, and we'll talk about that momentarily. And they also have the right to the equity of the corporation. They're considered to be equity owners of the corporation. That is, they're the ones that would get the assets of the corporation in the event that everything was liquidated and all its debts were paid. Now, these voting rights become important because this allows us to appoint the directors or to vote for or elect the directors of the corporation. The directors fill their own set of roles here. They have not rights here. They actually have responsibilities. They have a, in fact, fiduciary responsibility to the corporation. And there's a lot of debate about what that actually means, whether that means they're responsible to the shareholders or to the corporation itself. That's a big picture legal question that we don't really know the answer to. The directors then in their fiduciary responsibility are responsible for the day-to-day -day affairs of the corporation. Oops. Sorry, the day-to-day -day affairs of the corporation. So they're actually the ones who are responsible back to the shareholders to operate the corporation. And among other things, the directors would decide how much dividends the corporation would pay out to those shareholders. And then we have the people who are actually working in the corporation. So that's where we're going to have our management. And that's people like our officers. So the chief executive officer, the chief chief operating officer and so forth and we're also going to have then our executive our president our vice presidents and so forth and there's some blend here or some crossover between these for sure so then in addition to our management we have of course the staff the folks who fill the roles that uh, actually makes the corporation be able to go out and do what it does in a small business, when we're looking at a smaller incorporated entity, it's very common that the shareholder and the directors and the management and the staff are all the same person or group of people. But as businesses grow up and become more and more mature, we start to see more separation at each level here, where we have distinct management staff, directors, and shareholders. So those are the parties involved. So now what we're going to look at are some of the advantages and disadvantages to incorporating. So there are several advantages and depending on the exact structure we're using some of the advantages we see to incorporating are this separate legal liability. So if I'm a shareholder of a corporation and my corporation does something that would create some liability that liability stops for the most part at that corporation generally it won't impact on my personally owned assets. So we have separate legal liability. What else do we have to look at here? Well, we have, generally speaking, this is not universally true, but generally speaking, corporations pay lower taxes than individuals do. We have the ability then to bring in other shareholders so we can income split based on, for example, if I'm incorporating a business, I would have my spouse as a shareholder, and I would be a shareholder, and that way both of us can generate income out of that corporation. There can be some other problems with that, but that is an advantage that we have available. We have other advantages here. We have access to the ability to sell the business or sell the corporation in a tax-favored manner, maybe using the lifetime capital gains exemption which we'll talk about in another video this can actually save you a fair bit of taxes we can wipe out as of 2014 the first eight hundred thousand dollars of capital gains on the sale of qualifying small businesses other advantages to incorporating we have the ability some tax advantages here where we can 
carry forward losses. So if you have a loss in a year, you can actually carry that forward and use that against gains in a future year. Other benefits. We have the ability to defer income. And we can choose the character of our income where we can choose salary or dividends for our shareholders. So quite a few advantages here, and there are a few more, but those are some of the more obvious advantages to incorporating. And then we would look at some downsides potentially to incorporating some disadvantages as well. So some reasons why you might not want to incorporate. And you might consider here, oh, I should mention one more advantage, sorry, I missed a big one here, and that is the ease of succession. So with a corporation, you create a perpetual entity, and it does allow you then to sell that entity or to give that entity to another party. My disadvantages, then, if we'll pop over here, it is expensive. Now, some people will argue that you can set up a corporation for a relatively small financial commitment, and that's true, but when you do it yourself with these kinds of things, it's sort of like writing a will yourself. You're really maybe giving up some of the advantages when you don't take into account all the possible considerations that you should take into account. You have an initial cost of setting this thing up, and then you have some annual requirements. You have to file corporate returns annually. So whatever jurisdiction you've incorporated in is going to want to know that your corporation is still doing business, still alive as it were. And it's going to require corporate returns. And then also we're going to have tax returns that have to be filed each year. And those can be a little bit more cumbersome than your typical personal return. Now, this is debatable, but some people would argue that a corporation represents a loss of control or a potential loss of control. And this can happen in some cases where we have our shareholder who incorporates a business and then we have some directors here and maybe we bring in some more shareholders, sell some shares and those other shareholders don't agree with us and end up appointing a board of directors that doesn't necessarily support what we do. So you can have this potential loss of control and on the whole it's just a slightly more complex structure than just owning assets personally and running things personally. So those are the basics of incorporating or the basics of the corporation. We will talk about more of the detail around the corporation in a later set of videos. I hope this has been helpful just to give a basic understanding. This is sufficient at the level for those going through a life insurance course or for the mutual funds course. If you're in a financial planning course, then you're going to have to delve into especially issues around salary or dividends, the ability to defer income. There's much more to discuss in a financial planning course, and we will talk about those issues in a later video, or later videos, sorry. So I hope this is helpful, and uh, enjoy your continued studies. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. Again, this is Jason Watt, and in this particular video, we're going to look at the trust. And we're just going to look at a brief introduction to the trust, there's a lot more that we can potentially know about the trust, and we're going to look in some later videos at the application of these trusts. If you're going through a financial planning course, this is very important information. For those going through maybe the life insurance course or to a lesser extent the mutual funds course, this is good general information, but it's not the whole range of information. And of course, this does get into a little bit of legal and tax principles, and if you're looking for legal and accounting advice, of course, you should go out and seek the advice of a qualified professional. So a trust is basically just a way of owning property. And all we're going to do here is we're going to separate out the different ownership structures here. We're going to separate the legal ownership of property from the beneficial ownership of property. So the legal owner is the person who would have title to that property. For example, if we're talking about land, the person whose name is actually associated with the ownership of that property, whereas the beneficial ownership of property is where we have the right 
to enjoy the use of that property, the right to use it or the right to enjoy its use. And this is also incidentally where the tax consequences of ownership reside. So one of the better known financial planning instructors in the country, a fellow by the name of Larry Wood, will always say that trust means no trust. And I'm a big fan of this saying, it's a good way to look at this. We're going to use a trust only when there's somebody or some circumstance that we don't trust. If I trust everybody and I'm confident that things are going to just work out the way that they're supposed to work out, then I have no reason to separate the legal and beneficial ownership of a piece of property. I would just give that property straight over to the beneficial owner and let them enjoy both the beneficial use as well as the uh, use of that property in title, the legal ownership of that property. The origin of trust law actually dates back to uh, the uh, days of the Crusades, about uh, 900 years ago or thereabouts, when we would have, uh, especially uh, English knights, setting off to, uh, to wage war, and they would leave the property that they owned, their, uh, their domain, whatever it happened to be, uh, in trust. They would leave somebody else to own that property with the understanding that when they came back, they would resume uh, using that property for their own use. So that trustee, that person who took care of the property, was expected to look after it in the best interests of that knight who was going to be away and wouldn't be able to take care of their property. So normally when you see a trust, it's just drawn out as a triangle like this. Normally in an organizational chart, a, a trust is a triangle and a circle is a person. So we're going to see a few of each here. So I'm going to have oops, the settler of the trust. The settler of the trust is the person who actually establishes the trust. This is the person who's going to set up the trust, and this person is the one who's going to put property into the trust. We have to meet what are called the three certainties here. So we have certainty of intention. So there has to be a clear intention that the settler was going to take care of somebody else. That somebody else is what we call the beneficiary or the beneficiaries of the trust. So we would have these people out here, this beneficiary or beneficiary that would be taken care of. The fact that we know we're going to take care of them meets the certainty of intention. And the fact that we can identify those beneficiaries means that we have met the certainty of objects. That is, we know who the object of the trust are, who's going to benefit from this trust. And finally, we have to have some property that would settle into this trust. And that's what we call the certainty of subject matter. That is, we can identify that there is actually something that's been settled into this trust. And now we also have to name, and it doesn't have to be one person, this can be a person or this can be a corporation where we're going to have a trustee, somebody to take care of this property, this person, this trustee, and this is a word we've seen previously, has a fiduciary responsibility to the beneficiaries of the trust to some extent. They do have to look out for the best interest of those beneficiaries, but they first and foremost have to meet the conditions of the trust that are established by the settler. So an example of a trust, and it's easy to understand trusts when we start to look at examples of why they might be applied. So we might have a settler here who has died. If the settler is deceased, then we would have what's called a testamentary trust. It would normally be established through the will of the settler. It doesn't mean that they wrote their will while they, were the, while they were alive. That doesn't actually settle the trust or constitute the trust. They would have written their will and then when they died the trust is created. That's a testamentary trust. And they put some piece of property. Let's say, uh, how about the family cottage? 
into this trust. And they want their kids, maybe the reason they did this is because they didn't want their kids to squabble over the ownership of this cottage. So they say, my kids are the beneficiaries of this trust and there's no reason why you wouldn't maybe bring some grandkids in here. It doesn't hurt. In most cases, this would be the wise thing to do. Maybe even your uh, kids of, or the spouses of your kids. So there's all kinds of people that you could put in here. So we have these people now. So basically what we're saying is that these people can enjoy the beneficial use of this property. And now we're going to name a trustee. And maybe what you do here is you would have two of the kids uh, that you trust most. But you would say they still can't settle that property out to themselves. They have to look out for all of these beneficiaries. So put some restrictions in here. Basically, you're forcing them to take care of this property and not act in their own best interest, but act in the best interests of all of the beneficiaries. And probably what you would want to do with a trust like this, probably put a little bit of cash in here so that we can cover the maintenance costs of the cottage as well. Because otherwise you might create some dissent later on when it's time to uh, put a new dock in or something like that. So that's a fairly basic trust. And there are other rules. We're going to talk about taxation of a trust elsewhere. Uh, one thing I will mention here is there is typically a, a limit to how long a trust can exist, but it's very, very long, actually. Uh, the trust generally can stick around for up to the end of what we call the last life in being, so the last beneficiary's death. And depending on the province you're in, this rule is something like the last beneficiary's death plus typically another 20 years. So this could be a century-long arrangement, probably long enough for these kids to work out whatever problems they have and figure out something else to do with that cottage anyways. Now, one more thing I should mention, since I have it up on the board here, is that if my settler is alive when this trust is settled, then we're going to have what we call an intervivos trust. And that intervivos trust just means settlers alive. Even if the settler sets up a trust today, that's definitely an intervivos trust while they're alive. They die a year later. The trust still is an intervivos trust. It still retains that character that it was established while the settler was alive. So. That's a very basic way of looking at trusts. And again, just keep in mind that the biggest thing to consider here is that it's a separation of legal and beneficial ownership. We will look at taxation of trusts later on. We'll look at trust law in a little bit more detail later on. But for now, we recognize that the trust creates this separation here. And it should eliminate a trust problem or reduce a trust problem. I hope that helps. I hope you enjoy your ongoing studies and thank you very kindly.